Hello, I'm Wills Elliman with Newmark Knight Frank, and today we're having a conversation with Patrick Callahan of Compass Red. Hey, Wills, how are you? Thanks for having me. Great, thank I'm great, thank you. Very nice to see you. Good so, to see you. So, uh, 2020 has certainly been a tumultuous year. <laughs> um, yeah. So, how how have you steered Compass Red during these tumultuous times? Uh, it's a great question. You know, I had. Uh, lived through 2008 with a previous company. And uh, there were so many different reminders of the moments when you started to see some of the changes. And um, I remember in 2008, the financial crisis hitting in that week where we were all watching Bear Stearns hit. I think if we look at uh, the current um, environment and when it all kicked off, it was, I was sitting in March 13th and I heard our office in Philadelphia was gonna close down and the one here and everyone was gonna start walking working from home. So it was like a, that date will always burn in my memory. And um, I knew just based on the past experience and of course, hindsight's 2020, um, but there were going to be some uh, changes that we were going to have to pivot to right away. And um, certainly enough, there were some clients who dried up right away. Um, if you're doing supply chain analytics and there's no more supply chain, there's not much analysis you can do on it. But at the same time, there's a lot of COVID things that were going on that was going to need um, our company's help. Um, so we started making those calls on March 14th after the shock. And um, so that was one big thing. The other thing is like, you know, I, it rings in my head, never waste a good pandemic. Um, and I know that you know, so many other uh, people have talked about th that quote before, um, but really it does ring true. And I think that was keeping me up most of the time, both my business partners and, and I um, were constantly thinking about that. How, how can we take advantage of the moment? It's got to be a way to do it. So we started looking at some of the things that we could build internally, um, things that our clients had, um, and this is literally on March 14th, what have we been doing repeatedly that we could productize? What have we always wanted time to do? And, and that certainly was where we, um, we sat down and focused on. Um, so those are some of the big things that happened like as we started to steer the ship and we built a product. It took us two months to do it, but it was a perfect timing. And then I, I think the last thing that we did, just knowing from the past history was, um, we started looking at our financials. Like we, we wanted to make sure that every dime was looked at and every, uh, every investment that we made was scrutinized because this is going to be something that's going to be in for the long haul. Uh, so we hired an, a CFO, which we had wanted to do uh, a lot of in the past and then just buckled down, kept our head down, kept focus and then, and then moved on. I, and I wish I could say it was as clean as that, but and during the time when you're in the storm, it's messy. But when you look back, you're like, you know what? We made some good decisions and we made it through. Uh, so uh, I guess that's sort of how we changed a little bit. Great. Um, t tell us about Orbis Voice Natural natural Language Processing. Can, can you tell yeah. us about leveraging the, the natural language processing for human resources? Yeah, certainly. So... Um, as I mentioned, when we were um, when we decided on focusing on something, we looked at what our customers had repeatedly asked for and before. And one of our clients had um, been doing um, surveys for their employees. Uh, they're a company that's five thousand people or more. And um, when you do a survey, you get back all these open-ended fields. So you might ask your employees, um, "So what do you think we can do to improve our company?" And there are people who will write paragraphs of information and. When you do a survey and you get 5,000 surveys back and there's paragraphs that you have to, you just can't have one person surf through all that information and, and get some insight out of it. The second thing is like, if you start having multiple people read through those paragraphs, they're all going to come up with some different conclusion of what that paragraph said. So um, one of the tools, we have a product called Orbis, which takes in billions of records. Um, it's a big data platform, I guess is the best way to say it. And it uses natural language processing. So basically the computer reads through all the feedback. Um, it takes in all the other insight that came out. And, and in a fraction of what it would take a team of uh, humans to read through and get insight, it reads through it using artificial intelligence and says, here's what's being said here. Um, and then spits back to whoever's doing the analysis. Um, so we built that tool, Orbis Voice. Um, so basically we're listening to the voice of your consumer. And it turned out to be a really good time to do this. Because if you can think of it, not only has the pandemic changed the way we're doing business and, and companies want to 
look into the voice of their, con you know, their constituents. But also there was a bunch of, um, in a good way, uh, looking at social um, things that were going on, the social unrest that was going around the United States and around the world. And um, there's no better time to get the insight of what people are saying or what your employees are saying or even what your customers are saying. But you need that really fast. So Orbis Voice was able to take all that content in, spit out some information, and then um, give the insights to the people who needed to act on it and make decisions. So that was a little bit about it. Um, we're leveraging that right now because all our customers are starting to look into this. And then what other ways can we start to, we're asking ourselves, can, can we start to apply um, this type of analysis for? And it could be everything from customer analysis of products or um, there, there's just so many things to do. Our, even our state governor um, started using it when he was trying to listen to businesses and what was important to them as they open up. Uh, can you bring us up to uh, up to date on your recent hires? You know, who are you hiring your team? Yeah. So um, great question. We um, we've traditionally like when we started this out, um, we wanted to build an agency that uh, had never been built before. And uh, what that meant is like we had in the past had digital agencies that had creatives. And what we wanted to do is have people be creative with data. Um, and really trying to understand it and make insight off of it. So um, we would hire a data scientist and a data analyst uh, and sit them with a technologist. Um, the, the different pieces to that is a data analyst is looking at the data as it is and historically and trying to make sense of it. And a data scientist is trying to take that data and predict things. Um, and then the technologist is trying to make it all useful. So that was really the unicorn of what we were developing. Um, as we shifted into the COVID time and building product, and we started getting traction with our product with Orbis, um, it became important to um, hire software developers and architects. So that became the one piece of, um, that we didn't have before that we started investing in. So someone who has built product before, you know, when you're in the services world, um, you're responding to the customer's need, you're trying to stay ahead of the game, you're trying to uh, do fix various problems. When you're in the product world, you're um, developing a product that's going to have multiple users that you're going to have to support, and it's a different mindset. So we've recently started hiring that type of talent. Um, that was that's one area. The, the second thing that we started getting into is um, e even because the region we're in, and because of the timing, like there's a lot of talent that's out there um, in the data science world that's available now that wouldn't have done before because there's some com companies on the larger side who's, who have pulled back. Um, so we had a, a great internship program that we've been running uh, every year. And this year we've got like, I think 159 resumes for two open positions. Um, so that allowed us to get, you know, the cream of the crop up from some of the top universities. Let, we, let, me, let me get that right. Yeah. 159 resumes for two open positions. Two open positions. And, you know, this, these are um, positions that you would die for. Um, not die for, I mean, candidates that you would die for they're from mit they're from michigan they're from university of delaware drexel and they're from their phd programs penn um even out in stanford and it's it, it was a lot i mean there, don't be wrong we did a lot of work over the last you know five years to really talk about you know doing a lot of pr and some of the problems we're solving um so we had our name out there we had a great pro intern program that had gotten some traction um and students were really getting interested in it because it's a very specialized program. Um, but so we hired, you know, the two. I wish I could have hired all 159 of them because they were that worthy of it. Um, and, it, you know, we started going into it. So right now I'm trying to figure out, like, are there other ways that we can continue to hire these interns? And when I say they're interns, they're master's students and PhD students and some undergrad as well. Um, but they're very, very bright, uh, bright people. So that's what we've been focusing on. Well, great. So, so given those hires, um, let me ask you this. So last year, Compass Red was at the mill, uh, yep. which is a collaborative space. And then, um, and then you've moved to new, new collaborative space called the Data Loft and now CSH yeah. Station. Yeah, yeah. That's a few hops. Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when we, the very first day of starting this, um, uh, we were in the WeWork space uh, out in San Francisco. And um, the interesting thing about that is um, the collaborative, when you walk past, um, you know, there's uh, different phases of a company's start life. You need a different environment for where you are. 
um, WeWork gave us the opportunity to uh, meet other people that were totally not in our area. It's almost like uh, chocolate and peanut butter and yeah, it comes Reese's kind of thing. But you have <laughs> different mindsets and different different groups that can can make you aware of a technology that you weren't aware of before or a problem set. Um, and so being in that um, uh, in that type of collaborative workspace with different companies was really important. So when we came back, the mill was just literally opening up when we came back into Delaware. And uh, it was really starting to kick off. And I think we were the first people to actually go in the mill. Um, and that was great. So we were there for a while. We were all in one conference room. But then um, we started growing a little bit too too big, too much, you know, too many people. So we moved into um, a space off of Market Street in Wilmington, um, which was all of us. It wasn't, there wasn't other companies that were in the building. And uh, we there, we were going to try it out for a year. We thought we had grown to that size where we didn't want other people around. And um, that did, turned out to be not the case. It's really great to have other companies, other mindsets um, that are looking in from different problems. So um, talking with CSC, they wanted to open an innovation center on the waterfront here in Wilmington. Um, it was right next to the train station. We were pulling in talent from Philadelphia. And so uh, this was right before COVID hit. Um, we wanted to have a space that was literally five feet away from the train station. And it just happened that um, uh, CSC wanted to have a co-working space as well with really innovative companies. And so they're building that out right now. Um, we're on the fourth floor um, and we're waiting for our offices to be completed, uh, but we'll be right next to the train station. So it kind of goes, it shows the cycles of our company's growth. Very, very small um, in the very beginning. Then we start growing bigger. We wanted to be on our own, um, but then we also uh, began to crave the interaction of other companies. And so that's what we ended up doing. Well, well so, so you're not there yet, but how have your thoughts about remote working versus having office space as yep. a place to recruit talent and build culture, you know, through your office space. How's that changed because of COVID? Yeah, it's really hard, right? Uh, it, this was not part of the 2008 that uh, we all experienced, nor the 2000 dot com bubble. Um, so, um, luckily, there there is a fourth floor um, that we are on right now, but we haven't um, we haven't pushed to have the whole company in. Um, uh, I I come in every day. My business partner does. Uh, we're about 100 feet away from each other. Um, and, you know, I, we, we actually was just talking with Inc. Magazine about this, that there's um, the, different types of companies. If you're a maintained type company, like if you're, um, you have the same thing that you have to do every day, you, you run the same reports and all that kind of stuff, there's really not a huge amount of innovation that you need to be terribly concerned about. So you can work remotely. Um, and then, but if you're in an innovation type thing uh, or your growth type company where you're constantly evolving and changing and um, you need that interaction, it's really, really hard to do that via video um, because you'll have an idea and you can't schedule out innovation. Um, you can't say, well, we're only going to innovate on this time uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we've started bringing people back in now um, very, very carefully. Most of our frontline workers are those that don't feel comfortable coming in. You know, we ask them. Your your the priority is your safety. I um I start I've started to see a little bit more how um, different companies are starting to do the same thing. Um, I am, there's no science to this, even we're a data science company. But I've stopped in the Starbucks off of Market Street every once in a while, and they're starting to open back up, and they're starting to see people come in um, very very carefully. On the on the piece about um, recruiting. Um, I, I think we just have to offer everything and it depends on the talent that we're bringing in or the purpose. If it's going to be for innovation and it's going to be for collaboration, we're going to need some type of in-person, even if we're sitting outside type uh, discussion, but if it's a, the maintain type work, um, we're going to ask that they stay at home and keep themselves safe and that type of thing. But I got to imagine it's going to have an impact to lots of different companies. And hopefully this doesn't last forever. So, so, your, your data scientists have master's degrees, PhDs. You're talking about even your interns. Um, what's the attraction of Wilmington? Gosh, I don't even know where to start with that because it's, uh, we're so lucky to be here is the way, that, you know, it's uh, that greatest secret that, um, that's untold of a spot that you find that's just perfect. Um, and I can say that with pretty good authority because of having to start this thing out in San Francisco. Um, 
San Francisco, another great city. It's where a lot of innovation happens. I used to joke and say that the West Coast is a space where crazy ideas come up and then it's applied to reality when you come back here. Um, but the other thing that's crazy is the amount of it costs to live out there. So to build, um, a con when we went to hire our first data scientists, they needed two to three times the salary that I would have had to hire here in Delaware. And they needed that to live off of. They just graduated from you know, Berkeley. Uh, they had a family. They have to buy a $2 million house. You know, it's, and and that, that's a postage stamp. But in the competition for talent out there was so um, concentrated that it just becomes impossible for a company like ours to operate and service customers. So coming back here, not only did we have the advantage of having a realistically affordable workforce, um, you have two other things. One, we're right in the middle of an economic central that we could build our entire corporation and, and just be huge and not have to go 500 miles either direction. So being down in DC, uh, New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Delaware, and I think there's enough here in Delaware actually to to do build a really great company on. It's just perfect for that for that reason alone. Um, affordability, but is is a big thing. But the arts, the trails, everything is is very competitive. Um, but even more so, the workforce. I mean, we have had Dupont, we have Chase, we have Discover, we have Barclay Card, we have Wawa, we have a whole bunch of great companies that have some really really smart people. And um, the university systems is very, very concentrated between here and Philadelphia, uh, that you, you don't have to go that far to build a great organization. And um, there's parts of me that some days are happy that um, the big Amazons aren't here taking up all the talent. Um, and then on the other side, it's like, just keep it all quiet because um, we'd love to build a company and, and not have too much competition. <laughs> so it's perfect for us, yeah. So, 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 you know, we've been talking about Wilmington and, and how great it is. I yeah. totally agree with you. Yeah, how, how, how do you think COVID is going to change? How, how's Wilmington going to be changed by COVID? And what's the, what's the effect of COVID going forward with what you're doing in Wilmington? Yeah. So I think um, the, uh, you know, this is, uh, we have this conversation in all kinds of different areas um, uh, of, Places I get involved with, um, I do. You know, I do feel and I do think that there's, you know, a lot of people are going to be moving out of the big cities into the suburbs. So I think we have the opportunity to benefit from that. Um, I do think initially everybody's inside, right? So it doesn't matter if you're here or if you're um, in the New York City. Um, but I do think people are going to start to second guess, like, wh what value am I looking for when I'm living? So for Wilmington, um, it's a fine line, right? You don't want to have to, you don't want to seem like the, uh, the ambulance chaser and going after different cities, but you do want to tell the positive things to get more talent into the region um, and to share experiences and different innovation. Um, so I think in the long term, we're going to benefit big time. The greatest thing is like over the last two to three years, we've seen a complete change in the city. Um, with the number of great restaurants that have come in, the art venues, the trails, um, the developers have built and invested millions and millions of dollars into the last 10 years, that we've actually built a foundation that was ripe and perfect for when a situation like COVID comes. And so, like I said, never waste a good pandemic. It's almost like if hopefully, historically, um, we look back and it's like, wow, someone re was really smart to build that foundation before they knew COVID was coming along. Um, so I, I do think we'll benefit from it um, uh, just because of the same reasons that I moved back here. I think a lot of companies are finding that. And uh, some of the larger companies are also going to be looking for where can we have more space, more affordability, uh, a great workforce, an education system that's, that's fantastic. Um, a lot of good advantages that, uh, that can be built from. So, I, you know, I, I am like you, Will, uh, like very optimistic, uh, almost to the point of a fault. But I also am realistic. When you look at data, it seems like uh, it makes a lot of sense. I agree. Yeah. Can, can you uh, describe some of your recent projects, such as uh, what you're done, doing with Goodwill or the governor's dashboard? Yeah, sure. So again, what, what we do is um, analy analyze and then we predict as well. So with some of our clients, um, one kind of fun one is we have a, a, a large, um, I'll say it's a large major league organization um, that uh, needed us to predict like what would be the fair cost for a seat um, in a stadium. 
and you know for season ticket holders and so we're taking like 40,000 data points in and then we're predicting like this seat should cost this amount of money um, and this seat she should cost less because it maybe it's behind a pole or something like that like, so we're taking a large amount of data think of StubHub and that type of thing um, and we're we're concentrating it and then we're predicting what something should cost so that an organization an organization can sell that seat at a, at a fair price. You can apply that to so many different things. So, so goodwill, it might be, um, we need to predict out what this price of a, a t-shirt with a certain logo is instead of just a t-shirt with no logo. And so they're not leaving money on the table. So you take all these things and it's an algorithm that goes in, it predicts the price and then uh, that price gets applied and then it can be sold at the right price. Well, you can also look at like, um, when a governor has to make decisions on policy, they should be doing it from a data informed way instead of just a gut or if, instead of uh, someone saying, well, because of this, you, you should be doing it more informed. And so we, we help put the governor's dashboard together um, that helps predict out, like you know, helps them make evidence-based policy decisions. And that's the type of work we do. And it's not only just predicting, it's like putting it into the hands of people that are actually making the decisions at the right time. And it's to inform their insight and not to make the decision itself. There's a bunch of them. We've got a lot of great clients. Um, you know, everything from we're, we're listening to what people are saying during the pandemic uh, from a broad sense and um, helping inform the decision makers on that, that kind of stuff. So, so you've talked about the great, great benefits of, of being in Wilmington. What about geographic expansion? Uh, you know, you were in San Francisco. Would you go back there? Would you go to D.C., New York? Yeah. Or for a next office? Yeah, so certainly um, the, the attraction, a draw of the big cities is that they, there's a lot of companies with big problems. Um, and, you know, what, what our intention is in, in the short term is to build the base here in Delaware, where our, our home will always be, and then um, have like the remote teams into the different cities to help service our clients. Cause you, you know, in this type of work, you want the client to be able to sit right next by your side and say, well, these numbers are wrong or these numbers are right. Or what is that insight telling you? It's almost like when you, we were building websites, you, you want them to be right there. It's kind of difficult to do via zoom or, um, or over a telephone or, you know, and schedule that stuff out. So our idea would be like, if we could get, um, we're, you know, get a base in Philadelphia, which we have a few employees up there right now, keep our foundation here in Delaware, and then service um, the Washington, D.C. regions, the Baltimore region, um, or even the New York region um, over a long period of time, and, and even Boston. Um, I think that would be just fantastic. And you can't do that from, you can't be, do this from Phoenix, Arizona, or even from San Francisco, flying across country is just too much. Um, so we're going to build in our backyard and then keep our foundation here in Delaware. Okay. Uh, so, so Compass Red's closing in on its, its 10th year in business, and you've been named one of the top fastest growing companies in the country, according to Inc. Magazine. Yeah. So what's your vision for the next, next decade? Yeah. So um, it's kind of interesting. I still feel like we just started uh, yesterday. Um, the first, like, four or five years, we were just trying to figure out. It was, you know, it was, it was very small, and uh, we were trying to figure out what we were doing and make lots of mistakes. And then the f four years ago, four or five years ago is when we really got our footing. We're like, okay, now we're going. If you draw the analogy back to um, the, a book that I, I love to read every so often is what um, from McKinsey's company. They, McKinsey built, built a consulting firm when there was no such thing as management consulting. It didn't, I, I was surprised that there was a time when um, consulting didn't exist, but it really developed when there were some changes where DuPont then serviced the world. When you have global corporations, you need management engineers to engineer new solutions. So it's, businesses are built at tectonic shifts like that. And then there were um, the Anderson Consultings and the um, Price Waterhouses that came out of audit and they were built when computer systems started serving the services. And then you had the internet and all that kind of stuff where we've been going through a new um, process of data, data analytics, artificial intelligence. And that's what's at our core. And so we see this new tectonic shift is like, well, this is going to build new industries. And there are companies like Palantir, um, which I'm, you know, a lot of people have heard of 
Um, there's uh, groups all around the country that are just like us that are starting up. So we see this as a new industry of um, everything from robotic, robotic process automation to um, uh, data sets and doing the analysis on it to artificial intelligence that are going to need companies like ours. And we're finding that's been successful. So I still think the next 10 years, it's going to be a dramatic ramp up. I think we're going to be doing that um, uh, going into the multiple different, different cities. And as uh, our clients become more educated, just like when years ago when clients became more educated on what management consulting was, or 10 years ago when people were understanding what social media was, or 20 years ago what, what websites were, we're in that new upstage growth where people are starting to understand, oh, this is artificial intelligence and this is how we're going to grow. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. I think that uh, this will still see a ton of growth over the next 10 years. It's evidenced by everything from snowflakes going public last week or this week to Palantir joining. Thing. You know, there's been a lot of growth in this area. Um, so we're pretty bullish on it. Good. If, if we were sitting here, hopefully in person, three yeah. years from now, um, sitting back, looking back over today or looking back over that time, what would what would have to happen to make you happy? I tell you, the, the hardest thing that um, we run across is, uh, well, first of all, COVID would go away. <laughs> we wouldn't have to be <laughs> sitting, sitting in person. Um, the hardest thing that we have is, uh, I kind of referred to it just a second ago, is the education of the community. And um, before, when, like when the websites were still, you know, if we draw that analogy with the internet time when it was just starting foot, and you could point to a website and say, that's what I build. Data and data science and analytics and artificial intelligence is a little bit more difficult. It's hard to point at something and say, that's what, we're, that's what we do. Um, so the education of a client is super important. And one of the things that, um, that I see over the next three years happening is that these students that are coming out of university um, are really understanding this, and they're actually crafting those solutions for the future. So I think that as they graduate, um, they're going to start to see um, more educated clients and stuff like that in, in this area. And I think that'll be a big change in our industry that hopefully will be set up to ride on. It's all timing, right? Like you don't want to be too early. You don't want to be too late. Um, so it's just timing. So I hope within the next three years that happens. Good. Is there, is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to, like to, uh, just put out there? No, I think, um, you know, I, I alluded to this. I'm a big proponent. Um, I'd rather uh, plant a tree today and hopefully by the time I'm gone that um, it's gone big and beautiful and I don't need to see it big and beautiful tomorrow. And I think um, I, I look at companies that are, well, first of all, I think a lot of them should move to Delaware. Um, uh, but the other thing is that I'd like to see um, investment in the graduates from college students or give them a shot, think of them as, as apprentices, um, hire more of them, not because you're trying to give do a favor for them. Uh, but I think um, it's an investment in the company that when you hire someone who's coming right out of university, you're going to find them teaching you more than what you realize. And so allow those students to really uh, work and study in the area that they're passionate about. So um, the way we do our internship program is saying like, um, hey, we're going to bring you in. We want you to be focused on the things that you love because um, I think that'll teach us. And there's not been a time where we haven't learned something from the intern that's actually shaped our business that we've taken back to our clients. So I'd love to see corporations change their mindset to be, hey, we can actually learn off some of these students that are coming out of university and give them a shot and let them kind of expand and see things that they want to see. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for today. Yeah, thank you for the time. This is great. I really love what you're doing. And, and I look forward to seeing you in person soon. All right, great. Thanks, Liz. <laughs>